light to light my way. Truth is the light, so wise men say. Give me a light to light my way. Truth is the light, so wise men say. Give me a light to light my way. Truth is the light, so wise men say. Awaken him. How will he find us when he comes? Awake and ready. And when he asks us to dedicate our lives ever more perfectly to him, how will he find us? Awake and ready. Let's pray together. Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Mother Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Father Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Friend Beloved God, 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 Great Master, Great Master, Great Master Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna. Babaji Krishna. Lahiri Mahashaya. Lahiri Mahashaya. Swami Sri Yukteswar. Swami Sri Yukteswar. Paramahansa Yogananda. And Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions. Saints of all religions. We bow to you all. We bow to you all. Be with us now. Be with us now. Let us feel your guiding presence. Let us feel your guiding presence. In every day of our lives. In every day of our lives. Let us feel your uplifting presence in our hearts. Let us feel your uplifting presence in our hearts. Presence in our hearts. Your light guiding our consciousness. Your light guiding our consciousness. Bring us home. Bring us home. Home. Oh, peace. Peace. Amen. And 
Let's listen to these words from Affirmations for Self-Healing on our quality this week. Willpower. Willpower, and not the vague abstraction luck, is the secret of true achievement. Willpower on subtle energy levels generates what only looks like luck by magnetically attracting to us opportunities. Our will is strengthened by removing from our minds the no-saying tendency, the obstruction of doubt, of laziness, and of fear. Yes, even of the fear of success. Willpower is developed by persevering to the conclusion of whatever one attempts. One should start first with little undertakings, then proceed to bigger ones. Infinite willpower comes from harnessing the little human will to God's infinite, all-powerful consciousness. Let's affirm together as Yogananda Ji taught first out loud in a strong voice and then progressively softer until we do it silently. My will is to do that which is right to do. My will is to do that which is right to do. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Nothing can stop my progress. A little softer. My will is to do that which is right to do. My will is to do that which is right to do. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Nothing can stop my progress. Now in a whisper, but with increasing intensity of concentration. My will is to do that which is right to do. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Now mentally, my will is to do that which is right to do. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Now super consciously lifting it up, broadcasting it from the point between the eyebrows silently. My will is to do that which is right to do. Part all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Pray silently with me. Oh, infinite power. I will use my will, but guide thou my will in everything I do, that it reflect thy will. I'm Narayan, I think we know each other. Peter, and welcome to our friends joining us online too. And every week we share from Rays of the One Light. These are parallel passages from the Bible and the Gita. And this week's topic is reason versus intuition. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Jesus, when addressing his critics, appealed to reason and common sense. In his training of the disciples, however, he, like all great masters, encouraged them, encouraged in them the development of a higher faculty, soul intuition. For it is only by intuition that spiritual perceptions are achieved. In chapter 16 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, we find Jesus drawing on the intuition of his disciples by asking them who they thought he was in reality. They immediately understood that what he wanted from them was not a 
what he wanted from them was a subtle answer, not some obvious reply based on his nationality, sex, and the like. Peter it was at last who understood and answered the question on its intended level, the spiritual. Thou art the Christ, he said, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him, saying, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for not by human nature was this truth revealed to thee, but by my heavenly Father. And I tell thee this also, thou art Peter, which is to say, a rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and never will the powers of darkness overwhelm it. Jesus was pleased with his disciple for relating to the question on its deepest level. Reason could not have given Peter that answer. The answer came through the faculty of soul intuition and proved him thereby to be a spiritually advanced disciple. It was his intuitive perception, that insight which cannot be shaken by tempests of reasonable doubt that Jesus praised in referring to him as a rock. The church he referred to next was the edifice of cosmic consciousness. Any outer church institution would have to depend, as in fact the Christian churches have always done, on the level of understanding of its individual leaders and members. Peter's intuitive perceptions could never have been passed on to an outward succession of prelates. Clarity comes by direct soul perception. Confusion results from excessive dependence on reason as the guide to understanding. As the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita states, when your intellect at present confused by the diversity of teaching in the scriptures becomes steadfast in the ecstasy of deep meditation, then you will achieve final union with God. Thus, through holy scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. so far away. Thou dost tremble in my feelings. Thy presence glimmers through the veil of my thoughts. Yet dost thou seem so far away. Father, come, remove thy veil. Come, Father, come, hear the voice of my prayer. I want to know thee, to talk to thee, to hear thee speak to me. I want to pray to thee and know that thou dost hear my prayer. Show me the way that leads to thee. I, I was thinking this is a very important topic for our culture in particular. We tend to rely heavily on the reasoning faculty. We have a really strong idea of how things should operate in our world, whether it's um, you know, the, the traffic lights or <laughs> the, the, a store should be you know, a certain level of cleanliness or something. But you, you start, when you travel out abroad, you learn that there's different ways, right? Different ways of existing. Um, and you, there's, I've, I've been told that when Westerners go to India, there's kind of two camps. There's the Westerners that are just constantly trying to, you know, constantly thinking, this should be different and that should be different. And I should change that. And just, there's no end to it. <laughs> or there's the Westerners that can turn that part off and just mm -hmm. enjoy and go much more into the Indian bhav of, ah. of all this Brahma, all this Vasudev. <laughs> so you get to flow a little bit more. But um, we, in, our, in our culture, it's so much dependent on this reasoning faculty. And, and like the reading was saying, it can just, we can just be spinning our wheels and kind of going in circles when it's just the rational mind. And what we need to do is to develop this feeling nature. And in science in particular, we're very skeptical of uh, particularly emotions. And that's, that's well-founded. The emotions can very much you know, uh, affect our consciousness and affect our judgment. So 
But there's this difference that Yogananda and Kriyananda often talked about was that the, this difference between feeling and emotion. The emotion being this outward moving and um, roiling the waters of our consciousness and the, the calm intuitive feeling is this inward and upward a very peaceful feeling and, it, it, and that they don't they don't have a lot to do with each other, really. I mean, they, they're sort of two ends of the spectrum. They're, we need to draw and awaken that, that inner intuitive feeling. And uh, like the reading was talking about, it's vitally important. We can't have any spiritual perception without this, um, this feeling nature. Sri Yukteswar went so far as to say we can't take a single step on the spiritual path without awakening the natural love of the heart. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to open the heart, but also to guide the heart. Um, the, Yogananda had this beautiful phrase that I feel like could re revolutionize our culture if it sort of found its way out into the culture, and it's very simple, that reason follows feeling. Reason follows feeling. We think that, we tend to think in this society that the reason is uppermost, and the reason is sort of the master, and the feeling nature is the servant. But in fact, it's reverse. I was actually talking to a counselor, a uh, therapist, who was telling me that in her practice, she had actually come to this, where she, she saw that people were tying themselves up into all sorts of knots because they had this backwards. They were relying so heavily on the reason faculty and couldn't understand why they weren't acting rationally. But in fact, the feeling nature was, was leading, even though they were trying to lead with that, um, with that uh, reasoning faculty. And in fact, when we suppress the feeling nature, it comes back all the more, um, I was gonna say viciously, that might be not be the right word, but, but it comes back in a very confusing way where it's not connected anymore to the feeling originally. So it, it becomes distorted because it's been re uh, suppressed and rejected. So we need to develop, yes, this feeling nature, but also to uplift it and let it be guided by, uh, well, actually another, another comment that the Yogananda made was that reason, um, feeling must be kept in a calm state of reason. So this is one way that they, they're working together. They, so, and that they, it can be, the reason can be a good guide to let us know when our, our Emotions are upset, and we're um, we're going to go off in some, you know, if we felt if we followed that feeling, that that turbulent feeling, we'd go off in some random tangent in our lives that wouldn't actually be productive for us in terms of especially the spiritual search. It might just be a whole detour for us. I um, just last year I was actually sick during um, spiritual renewal week at Ananda Village, and it was it was disappointing because people come from all over and all, there's all these fun events and you know these spiritual talks and kirtans and so forth uh, these theater productions and it was disappointing to know that so many friends were there and i was stuck at home and uh, in fact it was during the season when there was all the forest fires well down here and up there um that uh so it was actually incredibly smoky as well and i was having sinus stuff and so i just i couldn't even go outside and i just um I was I was feeling very trapped in uh, in my in my nice little apartment, but it, I was becoming a cage nonetheless <laughs> because I, I I was feeling very stuck, and I sort of got onto this thread of of YouTube videos. I don't know if you're, if you're all familiar with with van life. You know, it's this it's this whole subculture which is actually pretty cool, where the people become fairly nomadic. They they outfit these older vans, customize them completely, and uh, and then will become fairly nomadic and travel wherever they want to go, the national parks, whatever. And, and I, I uh, you know, there's some part of me that just went, freedom, <laughs> this is what I need. And I, you know, so I was thinking, okay, I can get van, I have to, you know, outfit this, and it's tens of thousands of dollars, even on the cheaper end. And I was just kind of going through this whole thing. And I was, uh, but the, the really, my, my reason started to kick in, even when I was, even though I was ill, my reason started to come in and go, is this, this is a total divert, uh, break from your life so far. Is this actually, where you want to be going? Is this actually where you want to be putting your energy? And I could I could trace it back and go, well, my, I know my feeling is kind of disturbed being stuck here at home and feeling trapped. So maybe I need to wait. Maybe I need to wait until the feeling nature is more calm and I can make a more advised, you know, more better advised uh, decision. And uh, in fact, I was able to I was able to let the uh, the, the storm pass and I and I didn't go by the van. <laughs> not that I'm knocking it, but it's <laughs> for me it wasn't the right. There, I think I, you know, I, I, I was going to shopping afterwards. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah. But the interesting part of that was that I realized that that need for adventure was actually very valid, and so uh, that need for exploration. So I was able to find and tune into ways that fit my life much more. That impulse to to explore and see the beauty of God's creation was really valid, and so 
you know, I can find a way that fits my life a little bit better, rather than completely uprooting my life and creating a whole different mm -hmm. scenario. Um, I was, Swami Kriyananda used this description when talking about in, intuition. Um, when, again, when the feelings are calm and we're, we're listening for intuition, we're listening for guidance, the, uh, that, let's say you're in, a, you're in a city, on a city street, and you get the intuition to go north. And what many people will do is they'll grab onto that and be like, God told me to go north, and I'm just going to keep going north. But what's implicit in that is that you've stopped listening. And so the point is that you need to keep listening, because as Swami would say in this example, God may tell you to go east at the next intersection. And so it has to become this, this constant listening, this constant, and eventually a constant relationship of this, not even just listening, but attunement, of feeling the vibration from the, from the gurus, from divine love, from that infinite consciousness that is trying to draw you home to your own high reality in that consciousness. And so it needs to become this relationship, and we need to take that as devotees, take it deeper and deeper, and find ways to awaken that feeling of nature, like I was saying, but also to uplift it and to, to offer ourselves up into that presence to, to be able to receive that guidance. I, um, Neva was actually talking about this uh, concept at Enery Mill Week. Uh, somebody had come to her and was saying, Yogananda told me to do this, you know, and, and was kind of coming with that energy of like, I'm not going to listen to you, I'm not going to listen, you know, I'm, I'm done listening, I have my thing. And they weren't saying that, but that's, that was sort of implied. And, um, and Davy, to the audience there, just said, I don't know, I mean, Master doesn't tell me things. Like, that. he doesn't tell me to do things. And here she is, you know, she and Jyotish are the spiritual directors of Ananda Worldwide. They've been on the path for almost 50 years, and she's going, Master doesn't tell me to do things. <laughs> but she, she was just going to let that pass, but then she thought she better clarify that a little bit, which I'm grateful for. She said, you know, when I feel in tune with Master, I feel his blessing in my heart. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not, the pain, it, it's, it's painful. And that pain, she said, the pain becomes more and more intense over time as on her years on the path. And so that's the kind of relationship, that feeling relationship that we're looking for. The, um, it's, I actually got the chance to be in Italy. Uh, I actually spent the autumn in, in, uh, in Italy at our, at our center in Assisi. And it was really a beautiful experience this way because uh, Italy is a culture that's based much more on, on feeling and emotion, but feeling is like, it's, uh, you know, the, the Italy is where we get, you know, the dramatic operas and the arias and all that stuff. So, so it can go, the feeling nature can kind of go wherever, but there's feeling nature. And when it's turned to devotion, uh, typically there in the Catholic Church, but towards the saints and, and to Jesus and to Mary, it's, it's incredibly beautiful because that feeling nature is already woken and now it's being offered up to the divine. Swami went so far as to say that it's actually important for Ananda that there's an Ananda center there because it gives devotees a chance to tune into that feeling nature, that feeling um, part of our own selves, and to awaken that. And it was really, that's what I found being there, was that I could just sort of settle into that. It was a much different way of being. Things don't work as efficiently in Italy as they do here, but, but it's very sweet. Their culture, instead of being sort of driven by like efficiency and productivity and you know things have to work a certain way, like I was saying. It's driven much more by by beauty, by by spending time with friends and family, having a good meal together and, and sort of enjoying these the sweetness of life. And again, when that heart is open, it can be turned up towards the divine. And this is sort of the, the journey that we're on. And speaking of, of Assisi, Assisi is defined the, by St. Francis. He lived there some 800 years ago, but St. Francis and St. Clair still, still define the energy of that, of that town, and it's a really beautiful experience to go there um, on pilgrimage. And actually, I haven't told anybody yet, but I'm actually working on a pilgrimage to, uh, to go from LA to Italy next year. So, that aside, the, uh, the, the shrines of St. Francis and Clair are, are very beautiful, and one story in terms of attunement, in terms of listening to God, um, is really striking in St. Francis's life. His, his whole mission practically started with this crucifix um, and this dilapidated church, little temple, uh, chapel, actually coming to life and having a vision of Jesus and, and Jesus saying, Francis, rebuild my church. And Francis naturally, you know, was grateful, of course, and naturally was looking around at the dilapidated chapel and said, okay, well, rebuild the church. Oh, just, uh, and so we went out and begged for the, you know, the money or the, the stone and everything to, 
And eventually, with the help of others, you know, so some brothers were coming to join him, he actually rebuilt that little chapel. It's the Port Simple. You can still go and see it today. It's beautiful. And he thought he had done what he had been told to do. And then again, he got the, the call. Francis, rebuild my church. And he realized, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't all that Jesus meant. In fact, Jesus was saying, uplift my church. Uplift the whole Catholic church. Um, and it's very interesting to this day, the Franciscan monks, wherever you go in these, uh, to these Catholic shrines, whether it's in Italy or in Israel, the, the Franciscan monks are known for always being kind, always being sweet. And so it was really a reformation of the church that still lives 800 years later. But the, the point I wanted to make was that he, he understood all he could understand. And he, um, at, at that, on that first time, he, he embraced it and he put out the energy to make it happen. But he didn't, he didn't stop listening. He, in, in his case, yes, it was a vision in front of him and Jesus was saying that. But that first time it was a vision too. And he didn't, he didn't get the whole picture. And he had, to, he had to put out the energy and follow what he could. And then keep offering himself to Jesus, keep tuning in, keep listening. And then, indeed, he found that there was much more of the picture that he wasn't seeing at first. And this is, um, this is a really important part of diving into that intuitive faculty, is that we, we don't see the whole picture. We're, our consciousness isn't infinite. We don't see the whole show all at once. And we have to, we're given, perhaps, little pieces at a time. And if we follow that, we put out energy and take that step, then oftentimes the next, the next step will come. There's this image, I think it's in Buddhism, where the, the, of a saint actually take, stepping out across a lake in a, in a lily pad, and stepping up under, coming up under his foot with each step. But it's not there before. It's coming up with, just before he's putting his foot down to carry him across the, the pond. And it's, so this, in my own life, I, some years ago, I had, uh, an intuition. It wasn't the most recent intuition I've had, but this particular intuition, it wasn't like, I've never had one since. <laughs> but I, I, this, I had this intuition, it was a fairly, it was, it had something to, I don't remember exactly what it was, to be honest, but it had something to do with an upcoming direction of a novel. It was fairly broad that way. And I, so I had that intuition and it felt very true. And then, then the reasoning faculty came in and said, well, if that's true, then this must be true. And if this is true, then that must be true. And this, and then this. And, and I built this whole tower of thought on that intuition. And a few weeks went by and I real, I, I, what actually transpired was nothing close to where I had ended up. And I had to really take a step back because I thought, was my intuition wrong? I really, it really felt true. And then I, when I traced it back, I realized, no, that seed of intuition was true. But then the conscious mind comes in, the ego comes in, the, uh, the emotion comes in and says, well, I want it to be this way. And this, uh, this would be convenient for me. And I'm just going to build this whole thing up. And I had, I had stopped listening. I hadn't built, I hadn't, Swami Kriyananda said the uh, intuition needs to, uh, is always filtered through the mist of, our, of human preconceptions. And so that was happening. It, it was filtered through my own mist, my ego or whatever. It was, to, was building up this whole construct on top of a very true uh, intuition. And I would, thankfully, I was able to trace it back and realize, oh, if I had kept listening, I could have actually ended up with what was really happening. But I, but I hadn't. I had taken this intuition and run, a whole, run my own way with it. And so it's very important, just like Swami's example of turning left at the next intersection, turning east, is um, <coughs> right if we were going north. <laughs> it's very important to keep uh, to keep listening, and this, and then to to when it gets to the point where it's it's like Davy, where it's just when I'm in tune, I feel the blessing, and when I'm out of tune, it feels painful. That's a very refined feeling nature that she has. That it's 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 not about what I want what anybody else wants even, what everybody else thinks is right. It's about when I'm in tune, I feel blessing, and when I'm out of tune, I feel pain. I, I wanted to share another story that was very helpful for me in terms of listening to, uh, listening to guidance in the sense of knowing what to do in a particular situation in our lives. And Swami shared that a feeling of expansion is a very good form of guidance. And so, Years ago, he asked me to be in, um, well, the director of one of his plays asked me to be in the play. And I actually, at first, just told her no, because I didn't want to. I was very, I was very committed to not being on stage. I really didn't want to. <laughs> that wasn't what I, where I saw my life going. But the, uh, she said, well, let, let, me, let me write to Swami and see what he says. 
and I could sort of see the writing on the wall, like Swami would say, no, no, Peter can just do whatever he wants, you know. But, um, or, but so then she, she, we met again when, when Swami had gotten back to her, it was a few weeks later, and she said, well, I've never seen Swami be so enthusiastically supportive of somebody being in the peace treaty play. Uh, and then she just sort of put it to me, so what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, you know, what can I, what can I really say to that? You know, this is Swami's, I, I have an implicit trust in him to, to help me to help me grow and help me expand and help me to reach ultimately self-realization. So I was very interested in what he had to say. And, but the interesting thing as well was that I could feel inside of me, I took a moment and I could just feel it. There was one part of me that just really, really did not want to put out any energy and really wanted to shrink. This is going to be hard. I'm going to have to stand in front of people. I'm going, it, it's, it's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be, it, I'm going to have to really stretch. And then there was this other part that desperately wanted to expand, that desperately wanted to grow, and this is the sole call within each of us, uh, drawing us back to the divine, is this, this desire to expand, the de desire to expand our own reality, to embrace, ultimately, infinity, but even in just our little way, for me to get over that sense of shyness, of stage fright, and to, to embrace large reality. I can grow, I can expand, and I'm very grateful. He, I, there's a couple other times where he sort of pushed me in front of people like that. But uh, my own incl inclination probably would have been to be a hermit or to be something like that. And that's actually, uh, it, I, he, he as well, that was his own inclination. He had to learn that as well. So I'm grateful and, you know, to, that, to have his example. Um, and this is actually, uh, this is just an interesting, uh, interesting to me anyway. I hope it's interesting to you as well. I, I was really feeling this. This is much more recently. This is last year. I, um, I was feeling this, okay, yes, I'm supposed to be, you know, sharing more, sharing, being as much as I can as an instrument of uh, Swamiji and Master, but uh, my life wasn't really giving me the opportunity to do that, and I, and I, just different life circumstances were coming up that I really felt like my life was directing me to go into, like, a semi-seclusion or something like that, and I just, I, I put it very strongly to Master, like, okay, if you, if this is the way I'm, my, I feel like my life is going, if you think otherwise, you have to, you have to change it. Like I, you have to change the circumstances of my life, and so here I am. The, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wanted to share one last story that was um, with Joe and Davy as well. That uh, years ago I was working for um, a company that was owned by another spiritual community, and I, after my first trip there, I saw, you know, I got to visit with them. I got to sort of see what their community was about, and I, I came back and I, I had all these ideas about really from the rational mind of like, oh, they're really good at this, we should learn that from them, and, and you know, they can learn, you know, this from us, and we, you know, like, then we can create, like, this perfect community, like, of, you know, if we learn these different things from each other, and, and you know, that symbiosis, symbiosis isn't um, a bad thing, but it, but I was looking at it very much from the rational mind, and I had a meeting with Joe Tish and Davey, and, and it was just sharing some of these things, and, and this came from Joe Tish's wisdom and intuition, he said, you know, Ananda is like a rose, and this other community, is like a gardenia. Why do you why do you compare the rose to the gardenia? They're both beautiful. They're both beautiful flowers in this world that's mostly full of thorns. Why can't we appreciate the beauty and uh, and even the differences of both, and not try to make the rose a gardenia, and not try to make the gardenia a rose? And it's very interesting. I was having uh, years later. I was having this. Um, I was kind of doing the same thing, but instead of uh, with communities, it was actually with. Individuals. I was comparing myself to somebody else and saying, "Well, they they really should be doing this better, and I, I could do a better job than that." And that, and then, you know, and just kind of getting into this energy of comparison. And this is a real. This is a real. Um, this is sort of in the wheelhouse of the rational mind. It really likes to dissect and analyze things. And I thought of this um, of this example from Jyotish. I, I really. I, I knew I was. I knew I was off base, and so I was really praying for like just you know for the divine to help me out of this. And this. Uh, this thought of Jyotish just came into my mind as a sort of gift, just saying, you're a, you're a gardenia and, and he's a rose. Why are you comparing? Why are you saying he should be doing it differently? What you really, oftentimes when we're comparing ourselves to other people, we're saying they're not like me. You know, and this is, and Swami would talk about actually, how boring would the world be if everyone was like you? You know, it might be, it might be fun for a day or two, but then we get pretty dull. You know? um, but this, this idea that we can see the divine um, beauty be trying to be expressed in different forms, in different ways. And maybe they haven't reached that final point where the, 
they're, they've reached that final liberation, that final realization. But the divine is trying to peek through. The infinite consciousness is trying to peek through in different ways, and, it, and through different people and different expressions. And if we can see the divine outwardly and, and be tuning in ever more deeply inwardly, like Davy was, we can keep coming back to that presence of the divine inside us and out in, in the world, being expressed in the world around us. And bit by bit, that gets refined. Bit by bit, she's been on the they've been on the path for 50 years. It takes sometimes it takes, it takes a long time. I don't want to leave you with that thought. <laughs> it's going to take forever. But the point is, you start from where you are, and you just keep her trying to refine this process of opening up more and more inwardly to the divine. Sure.